Hey, greetings, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is GleeCon here again, bringing you another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Thank you for tuning in. On our last episode, we continued the Horde grind through Northern Stranglethorn Vale. We did the Warlock, um, Farinell, and he killed some Panthers, and we're kind of, we bottlenecked to where we can't, well, actually, he might be able to begin slaying some raptors on his final episode um or talanji will who is uh, what we're going to do tomorrow well uh, not tomorrow actually um tomorrow will probably be the one day this upcoming week that i don't make a video i have a a thing i have to do this judging uh thing for one of, uh one of the programs that my son's in um so i'll be going from work to that we won't be home till like nine o'clock at night so by the time we do that and get home after such a long day and do dinner and all that stuff, it'll be, it'll be so late. I'm, I'm imagining I'm going to be bushed. Um, and I haven't today. I had a really late day too. Um, so I didn't get a chance to catch up with Talanja to get her where Farinel's at. Um, cause she has to not only beat the Raptors, but then also get to level 29 too, or not the Raptors, the Panthers, or she won't be able to kill the Raptors. So, um, I'll probably handle some of that off scene tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so I'll see you guys in a couple days after this, but for now, we're going to start the fourth part. Don't know if it's the final part. It's called Rising Inferno of Sk War of the Scaleborn. On the last episode, we read about how the Order Dragons are going to prepare for the war against the Aspects, the impending war. And then Farak came and tried to actually attack the Emerald, um, well, not the Emerald Dream, but is Sarah's kind of region out there past the on around plains, but she has a border, a boundary set up. He couldn't get through it. So that front kind of shut down. It's, it's, they, you could say they won the battle, but all they've done is created a, a nigh impregnable defense. So the primals will have to spread their, it kind of takes you Sarah out of the picture. So now it's like a four V three battle instead of the five V three. So stay a while and listen, as now we, uh, we're we going to kick off the next chapter, which is, I think, chapter yeah, 18. But first, we have a little from the oral histories of us, Nozdormu, the timeless one. For 24 hours, the barriers have protected the broodlands from invasion. Neltharian shadow scales turned to Riddikron's own tactics against him, spreading rumors and lies that the barriers would order any primal dragon who touched them. Neltharion also threatened to collapse Razagath's prison should the stone scaled continue his earthquakes. The ground beneath us fell silent. For a time, the primal dragon stayed away from even our farthest flung borders, but the primalist territory could not support their burgeoning numbers. Oh, 24 years, not 24 hours. Hunger set in and the primalist began to question Redicron's leadership. Concerned, the stone scaled ordered a strike on Wormrest Temple, which later became known as the Battle of Dragon Blight. Our flight successfully held the temple against Farrakh and his legions, but we lost every wing length of territory between Wormrest and Harrow's Deep. Now our flights keep the temple ensconced in shields and protective magics. The flights use arcane elementals to ferry supplies through portals, and the shadow scales of the Black Dragon flight use it as a base for their intelligence activities. As we have fought our battles in the west, we have slowly lost ground against the primalist greater numbers. We snatched several victories from the jaws of defeat, and though we have lost territory, we have whittled some thousand dragons out of the primalist ranks. Some have defected, others have died, starved, or been struck down on the battlefield. Vitelinov fell at Icewing Rift to the leader of the Hearts Guard, Bajzans. Bozh Bozh I don't even know how to say that. Bajzans, removing one of Viranoth's most trusted lieutenants from the field. Lavarian, flight master of the Black Dragon Flight, slew Oxoria's mate at Cinderfrost Vale. Then went Talon to Talon with the Grand Matriarch herself. He lost an eye for his trouble, but Neltharion promoted him to Flight Commander of the Black Dragon Flight for his exemplary service. At the Molten Abyss, the Blue Dragon Flight used illusory magics to trick an entire Primalist Legion to fly underground where the Black Dragon Flight promptly cracked the Earth's crust and buried them beneath the ground. Baragos, the Ark Librarian of the Azure Archives, was responsible for engineering that feat. By relying on unconventional tactics in the field and leveraging our flight's abilities to their full extent, we've lost no more than 100 dragons over the years. We have several advantages over the Primalists. For one, we have been Primal dragons, but they've never been ordered. The Primalists do not understand how we think, but we are intimately familiar with the inner workings of their minds. 
However, we retreat from two battles for every one we win, preserving the lives of our flights over digging our talents into an empty tundra. But with each year that passes, the primalists push a little closer to the broodlands, and before long, we won't be fighting to cull their numbers. We'll be fighting for our lives. The barriers won't hold forever. Even if Eridicron isn't aware of this fact, we aspects are. We've not wasted the time given to us working tirelessly to prepare our flights to defend the home front. Alex Shaza holds war games, skirmishes, and tournaments to encourage a spirit of cooperation among the flights. She created flight academies for the Drakes, elder and younger, to encourage them to build the skills they need to defend the Broodlands and later Azeroth at large. Elder Drakes now join border patrols with fully grown dragons. The hammers and the obsidian citadel never stop ringing, and Eltharian shadow scales have eyes throughout the dragon wilds. From the Emerald Gardens, Isera mobilizes the considerable number of mortal tribes that have migrated to her lands, teaching them to tend the fields and fostering a respect for nature. The Greens drive herds from the wilds into the plains, preparing for a siege. Malagos and the Blues have reinforced the ley lines throughout the Broodlands, giving them access to a robust font of arcane power, and we Bronzes have increased our mastery of the timeways, able to see future events with more clarity, if not more certainty. Our time grows short. We are at war. Chapter 18 On a late summer's day, Alexstrasza stepped from the vault of the Incarnates alone. She paused on the edge of the terrace in the sunshine, sensing a chill upon the wind. For nigh unto twenty-five years the Broodlands had enjoyed relative peace, but she knew it would not last. Still, the flights had not wasted the time. The Vault of the Incarnates was a testament to the Black and Bronze Dragonflight's ingenuity. With its white marble columns and golden pediments, the Vault was a stunning addition to the sights of Thaldrassus. Blooming fora cascaded from the mountainsides, blessed rivers crashed down on either side of the Vault, filling a sparkling pool at its base, birds filled the air with song. Had she not known the true purpose of this place, the Lifebinder would have found it peaceful, serene. But the Vault was little more than a beautiful prison, a small kindness for those they had once called kin friend. Alexstrasza tried not to think too much on its purpose. Now Therian had seated the Vault of the Incarnates on an underground bed of magma, allowing its foundation to better absorb certain types of seismic waves. Inside, Nosdormu and the Titanforged had created three spherical cells, each one designed to hold an incarnate in perpetual stasis. Razageth would remain in the Reach, where her prison was reinforced with Malagos's most potent wards, as of today, Nosdormu and his bronze dragonflights were finishing the time enchantments on each cell. Everything, at least for the vault, was ready. Heavy footsteps studded across the platform. Is everything all right, Alexstrasza? Nosdormu asked, pausing beside her, his scales gleaming like gold in the afternoon sunlight. Perhaps that was not the best way to word the question. Not much is all right at the moment, is it? Alexstrasza sighed, looking over the crater toward Tearhold. Tell me, she said quietly, knowing the gravity of the question she asked, was there a wiser Alexstrasza in the timeways, one who managed to lead the flights through this conflict without war? Some managed to avoid war, yes, Nosdormu said, but I would not say they were wiser, as it always came at a terrible cost. In one timeline, Alexstrasza hunted down each incarnate and challenged them herself, slaying them one by one. The actions poisoned her heart, turning her into a dark queen who eventually broke the very world she had pledged to save. In another, she forced all dragons to accept order magic on pain of death. Thousands were slaughtered. Those words brought Alexstrasza no comfort. She shuddered, wondering what sort of power would drive her to break the world in two. I know you blame yourself, Alexstrasza, but this conflict is no fault of yours, Nosdormu said, smiling as two messengers swooped toward the terrace, belying the weightiness of his words. Know that a clean victory is not achieved easily in any timeline. The battles we fight will be brutal and bloody, and they will harrow our flights to the core. But there is only one predictor of failure that seems inescapable. And what is that? Alexstrasza asked. Your death, Nosdormu replied, turning his incisive gaze on her, his smile falling. In no timeline do the flights survive without you. In the coming days, if you risk your own life, you may risk the lives of us all. She drew a sharp breath, but gave him a nod. We need you, 
our queen, as Dormu said. You may not realize it, but you are the beating heart of our flights. The only way any of us will survive the coming war is if you have the strength and courage to follow yours. The beating heart of our flights. How often had she heard those words said by her sister, her consort, her allies, all of whom thought them a compliment, a kindness. But Alex Straza knew them now for what they were, a weight. Oh, no, Stormu, she said as the messengers alighted on the terrace. Sometimes I wonder why Tyr named me Dragon Queen when I have made so many mistakes. I... She trailed off, picturing the fury and pain she had seen in Virenoth's eyes. She thought of the drakes who claimed to remember being taken from their nests in the dragon wilds and the primal dragons like Luxoria, who had flown to Harrow's Deep in defense of their broods, fearing Alexstrasza might come for their whelplings next. When you are convinced of your own righteousness, no act becomes unconscionable. For so many years, Alexstrasza thought she was serving the greater good, following the wisdom of the keepers, but now she realized that the greater good had no single definition. Even her best intentions led to unforeseen ends, complications she had scarcely imagined, and trying to oblige two conflicting sides only fanned the flames of war. Know that I have never questioned Tyr's choice, Nosdormu said, interrupting her thoughts. His charge was the stewardship and safety of Azeroth. You will achieve that and more, Alexstrasza. Take heart. Thank you, my friend, she said. I shall remember your words as the hour grows ever darker. Nosdormu bowed his head. I hope you shall. My aspect, the red dragon, Timaeus Straz, alighted on the terrace and dipped his head in a hasty bow. We bring an emergency summons to the seat of the aspects from Malagos, the spellweaver. What has happened? Alexstrasza asked, stretching her wings to prepare them for flight as she strode toward the edge of the platform. The blue dragon flight caught several drakes attempting to compromise the metal crystal that powers our barriers, Timaeus Straz said. The spell weaver says it may not last the day. No. The breath left Alexstrasza's chest. That is not all, the black dragon stallion bowed. The primalists are moving their forces toward the reach under the command of Virenoth the Frozen Heart. We believe they are preparing for an attack. What? Nazdormu asked, recoiling. Let us fly for the seat at once, Alexstrasza said, leaping into the air before the words were off her lips. The others scrambled to follow her. As she soared past Tearhold, flying fast as her wings could carry her, she felt they would not dodge this blow as, easy as, as easily as the last one. War now came to their lands in earnest. She could not, nay, would not, fail her kind. Alexstrasza slammed into the terrace at the seat of the Aspects, not surprised to find a crowd of dragons milling about the council chambers. Aspects, major domos, consorts, and flight leaders alike. Tension hung so thick in the air, Alexstrasza th thought she might slice it with her talons. Dragons scrambled out of the way as the lifebanders strode into the main chamber, shouting, Malogos, tell me what has happened! The blue aspect lifted his head wearily. The decades of supporting the arcane fonts at Vakthros and the Azure Archives had taken their toll. His scales had faded to a dull blue, and the vibrant fire in his eyes had all but gone out. His cheeks were hollow, his shoulders hunched, and his wing membranes were dry as the pages of the books he so loved. His consort, Sindragosa, stepped forward to speak on his behalf, but Malagos waved her down. Sidebar, who the heck invented books, if basically until now all that's existed is dragons? How does he love them so well? Who invented them? The Spellweaver sighed. I'm sorry, Alexstrasza, but I fear the barriers will not hold much longer. It is all right, my friend, Alexstrasza said gently, taking her place among the flight. Tyrannostras curled his tail around hers, providing unspoken support while Sarah Straz shifted a few steps to the lifebinder's left, giving her room. She continued, looking to the blue aspect. You and the blue dragonflight have given so much to defend us all, and our gratitude is boundless. We knew this day would come. But you must tell me how our drakes hastened it along. Malagos nodded. Less than an hour ago, Sindragosa caught six drakes attempting to shatter the mana crystal that lies far within the depths of the Azure Archives. The crystal feeds the ley lines to the, this crystal feeds the ley lines to the obelisk, she asked, her heart fluttering. The very same, he said. How severe is the damage, Alexstrasza asked. The spellweaver opened his mouth to speak, but exhaled and shook his head instead. Sindragosa put a forepaw on Malagosa's shoulder. We cannot fix it, my queen, not in time to save the barriers. 
I am sorry. Young Drake Siragosa employed primalist techniques to disable the archive's defenses. Ice in particular. Alex Straza pressed her lips together. Our Drakes have been consorting with primalists? With Viranoff, Neltharian spat. The Red Drake Talon Straws admitted it proudly. Cries erupted around the seat. Talon Straws, the lifebinder thought, and narrowed her eyes. She remembered the brazen little red too well, though she had never imagined that youthful insolence would turn into full scale rebellion. The news only stoked Alex Straza's anger. How dare they consort with the enemy, thereby putting thousands upon thousands of lives at risk? Did they think Farrakh would spare the whelps at the ruby life pools? That Viranoth would not sink the broodlands into an age of never melting ice? That Eridicron would not pull the very mountains down on their heads? Who else? Alex Straza asked. Name them. It was Sindragosa who spoke. Elagos, Noles Dormu, Azarian, and Nevaris. One from every flight and two from mine. Have they been apprehended? The Lightbinder asked, looking to Neltharion. The shellar scales are questioning him the dungeons of the citadel as we speak, the black aspect said. Good, Alexstrasza replied. Major Domos, capture every drake who might be associated with Talonstrasza's movement and send them to the Obsidian Citadel for interrogation. The rest of us should prepare for the attack. You cannot pretend that they did not have a point, a voice rang out from the blue's wing, interrupting the life binder. Silence descended over the chamber like a shroud. Every eye in the chamber turned towards Stelagos, a wing leader with Malagos' spell scales. Stelagos, the blue aspect said with a sigh, we've spoken of this before. Now is not the time. We all heard what Farak said at the peace summit, Stelagos said, and later what Viranoth said over Wormrest Temple. We all heard her accuse the Dragon Queen of stealing eggs from the nests of primal dragons. I said that was enough, Malagos snapped. Skelagos continued, you cannot hide it any longer. Enough, Malagos whirled on Stelagos, his fury sparking as fast as the arcane fire along his talons. Stelagos recoiled, dropping his head to protect his throat and ruffling his scales. Talons shrieked against stone. Even Sindragosa, calm, unflappable Sindragosa curled her lips in a snarl. Fear spiked the chamber and the greens and bronzes recoiled from the blues. It is all right, everyone, Alex Straza said, sending a gentle pulse of ruby light through the room, hoping to soothe tensions. Malagos, please do not strain yourself for my sake. The spellweaver looked to her, blew out a breath, and sat back, hanging his head not in defeat or shame, but in simple fatigue. She did not fault him for his temper. Malagos had never suffered fools gladly, and he was tired. So tired. She could sense the relentless exhaustion he shouldered every day, testing not only his spirit, but the very bonds of loyalty he had with the other aspects, his friends. She had asked much of the blue aspect, too much, and he had given his all. Stelagos turned his gaze on Alexstrasza, raising his voice. Would you deny it? Is it true you sanctioned the theft of dragon's eggs from the wilds? The blue's voice rang through the sky so loud that flyers by turned to look in the direction of the seat. Alex Straza kept her features neutral, careful not to show her consternation. She did not look to Neltharion nor to her sister. Instead, she held the blue's gaze unflinching, unrelenting, till he dropped his eyes and stared at the ground. Once, long ago, Nosdormu had warned her it might come to this, that the very futures of her flights might hinge on the outcome of that fateful decision. I see a thousand futures before our flights, but I could not tell you which way the sands of time will flow. Taking primal dragon eggs from the wilds may be a boon to our flights. It also may be the choice that ends them. The flights needed to survive. They had to survive, and she could no longer pretend that the Aspects hadn't made difficult choices in pursuit of that goal. She could feel Neltharion's gaze boring into her scales, imploring her to hide the truth, begging her not to say the words that were about to flow straight from her heart. But Alexstrasza was Dragon Queen, and she had learned through sad experience that what happened when she did not trust those closest to her with the truth. No more secrets. Listen to me, and listen well, Alexstrasza said to everyone in the chamber, for if you have any love for your flights, you will understand why we, as Aspects, made a difficult choice more than three centuries ago. Now Therian closed his eyes, saying nothing. As a wave of uncertainty washed over the chamber, Alexstrasza continued, At tears behest, and in order to fulfill the oaths we made to one another and to this world, 
The aspect sanctioned the retrieval of primal dragon eggs from the dragon wilds. She paused for a moment, giving the assembly a moment to reckon with her words. It wasn't a revelation, but the Lifebinder's confirmation of the truth changed everything. The reds at her side and back, however, did not so much as question her, their resolve unshaken. The bronzes, too, looked wholly unsurprised, unruffled. The blues and greens took this confirmation with less forbearance, looking to one another askance. The black dragons looked impressed, almost smug. We struggled with this directive, Alex Straza said, looking to his Sarah. We had no desire to take eggs from their rightful parents. As a compromise, I ordered the Titan Forge to take only the eggs from untended nests in the wilds, which might just as easily have been snatched up by predators. Still, I struggled with this decision. When Farak imbued himself with the power of the elements, a new movement took hold. The Primalists labeled us as abominations, aberrations, thralls to the Titans. They said we were dangerous, that we should be eliminated. We knew he would not stop until the Broodlands burned and every ordered dragon along with it. Alexstrasza swept her gaze across the room. Tell me true, would you not have made a similar decision, faced with the horrors that now bristle on our borders? Would you not have moved to strengthen your own numbers while weakening those of your opponents? Would you not have done all in your power to ensure the survival of your kind? One green spoke up from the back, saying, But... Wasn't this why the Incarnates refused peace with the Broodlands? This information turned Viranoth against us. They would have come for us anyway, Sarah Straz snapped, stepping forward to flank Alex Straza. Iridicron wanted a reason to declare war on the Broodlands. But we could have had more time, Stelikos said. Perhaps we could have had a thousand years of tentative peace rather than a few hundred. In time, we might have found a way to coexist with them. There can be no talk of peace, no coexistence with those who believe. We should not exist, Agnion of the Shadow Scales said, making a rumbling noise in his chest. I've watched them for centuries, and I tell you now, the Incarnates never wanted anything but an end to our kind. Stelago squared, squared his shoulders and lifted his head. I refuse to believe there was no other path to peace. It was not the eggs that tipped the scales of war, Stelagos, but Razageth's capture, Alexstrasza said softly, and yet her words made all the other voices in the chamber fall quiet. Would you have me release the Storm Eater, even to win another century of peace? She would not give it to you. Remember, she attacked us first. The blue stepped back, chastised. Every eye turned back to the Lifebinder, expectant. Though the dragons remained outwardly stoic, their fear, anger, and confusion simmered through the chamber. She needed the leaders around her to see the situation with clarity or else many lives would be snuffed out this day. As we speak, our enemies fly on our borders, Alexstrasza said. Our flights, our families, and our very way of life will soon be under attack. I do not need to explain to this assembly what will happen if the broodlands fall. I empathize with your frustration and anger, she said as she looked at Stelagos, who bent his head. For well, this is the way I felt when Tyr first asked the Aspects to recover the eggs from the wilds. My heart cried out against the command. Now that you know the truth of the matter, I will not fault you, if you choose to depart Valdraken and tarry with the dragon flights no more. The choice to remain is yours and yours alone. I will never sanction the removal of individual agency again. You are the leaders of our flights, she said, lifting her gaze and squaring her shoulders. If we are to weather the coming storms, the hearts in this room must be in accord. I cannot promise that I will ever be a perfect leader, but I can promise that I will ever work to preserve your health and happiness. I will fight to my dying breath to protect you, celebrate your victories with you, and lift you up in times of need. But above all, I swear this day that I shall never hide my work from you again. Alexstrasza had broken a promise once, and she and her flights would pay dearly for that mistake. She would not make such an error again. Resolute, she lifted her voice and said, Our skies grow dark. Will you stand with me now and defend our beloved home? Ysera said, Always, before the words were off the Lifebinder's lips, Tyrannostras thumped his tail on the ground, sending tremors to the floor. I am ever by your side, Alexstrasza. As are all in our flight, Sarah Strauss said. We will not allow our kind to abandon hope. Now Therian stepped forward. The black dragon flight stands ready to defend the broodlands with you, my queen. 
The black dragons around him lifted their heads and trumpeted their war calls. Their flight had been preparing for this day for centuries. As does the blue, Maligos said, lifting his head. For the first time in many years, a spark of arcane fire lit the spellweaver's eyes. Behind him, Stelagos closed his eyes but dipped his head and nod. So too shall the bronze dragon flight bring all our talents to bear. Yeah, see, they, they weren't surprised because they freaking already know. They know the time ways, Nosdormus said. <laughs> he didn't say that part. Before he could say aught else, a sob echoed from his camp, shattering the tremulous thread of hope she had formed. So adore me. The bronze aspect said, turning to his consort with a frown. Whatever is the matter? Gold light glazed Soradormi's eyes. Bright tears leaked down her cheek. Tremors raced through her legs and she pressed her wings against her back. The plains are burning, she said with another sob. I can see it close in the distance. The rock is burning the emerald gardens with an army of primalists. I don't know. There's not much time but the portal to the dream. Ah! Isera cried out, sending all the little birds that nested in her horns scattering. The greens panicked, looking to their aspect for orders. Go, sister, Alexstrasza said. We may not have much time. Go! Isera gave her queen a nod. Titans be with you, sister. And with you, the lifebinder said, wishing they had enough time for a proper goodbye. As the greens leapt into the skies, chaos broke out in the seat. Aspects conferred with their flight commanders, barking orders and sending dragons scattering in all directions. Alexstrasza returned to the chamber, summoning up her campaign map from the floor. The seat emptied, leaving the remaining four aspects alone. So it begins, Naltharion said, joining Alexstrasza at her right wing. Don't sound too excited, Maligo said, shooting the earth water one of his looks. Despite the spellweaver's exhaustion, he never tired of ribbing the black aspect. Naltharion frowned, but before he could respond, Alexstrasza interrupted. Much as I enjoy your banter, our time is limited. We must defend the Reach and the Emerald Gardens from a primalist assault. Now Therian and I will go north to defend the Reach with the Reds, taking a position at the Conservatory. She tapped the Lifebinder Conservatory with her talons, setting it alight with red flame. Her ruby pawns slid across the floor toward the keep, while Now Therians moved to the border of the Reach. Now Therian slid one of his battalions to the Emerald Plains. I have sent Garion and his iron scales to provide frontline support to the Greens. Good, Alexstrasza said. Malagos, I suspect you will want to return to the Azure Archives post-haste. Preferably, the blue aspect said. I may be able to win us a few more hours of time. Very well, do what you must, she replied, sliding his sapphire pawn to the Archives. Nosdormu, you should return to the Temporal Conflux and prepare for an attack. We don't yet know if Eridicron is on the field. At once, the bronze aspect said. Alexstrasza scanned the campaign map, looking for weaknesses. Am I missing anything, Neltharion? No, he replied. I sent Leverian to the Obsidian Citadel to lead a combined force of the earthen bulwark, draconid, and mortals hidden in the canyons of the waking shores. We have ghost armies in position to force our enemies to engage us in more favorable locations that will incur less loss of life. And we have draconid along the border operating the Dragon Killer Artillery. Let us hope it will be enough, Alexstrasza said. By wing and by talon, I will not let the Broodlands fall this day. Virenoth stood on a ledge outside the Reach studying the vermilion barrier that enclosed the whole of the waking shores. Tendrils of ruby light curled toward the sky, tinging the clouds pink. The sun sank toward the horizon, and on the other side of the barrier she could see the destruction her sisters had wrought in the Reach. She knew Razagath could be reckless, but she also knew her sister would not have attacked the Broodlands without reason. Now Therian was hiding something in the Reach, and her sister had paid the price. I will set you free, Razagath, you are not thought. No matter what it takes, I will see the wind fill your wings once more. This moment had been almost twenty-five years in the making. The Frozen Heart had taken the young ordered drakes under her wing, speaking with them infrequently to keep from arousing the Aspect's suspicions, it had taken years to teach Siragosa the right spells, then to position the drake inside the Azure Archives as her trusted under-librarian. Siragosa? I gotta go back and see. I can't remember who his consort is. 
Valley Ghost says, I thought it was. I'm trying to look for the oh, Cinder Ghost says it's consort. Okay, so I was a little wrong on that. Razvik landed beside Viranov, touching his wing talon to his chest. Over the last 50 years, the mottled green had become indispensable to her, serving as her right wing, advisor, and confidant. He and his mate were family, and their whelps looked to Viranov as their grand dame. It was Razvik who stood guard as Viranov had been imbued with the element of ice. Razvik who had dubbed her the Frozen Heart in the wake of Alex Straza's betrayal. Razvik who flew at her right wing as they seized Wormrest Temple for the first time. The sun flies toward the horizon, he said, lifting his head and scenting the air. He had learned much from Virenoth about tactics and coordination. Your drakes are late. Patience, Virenoth said. If they had failed, the black dragonflight would not bristle at the border as they do. Is everyone in position? Indeed, Razvik said. Good. Virenoth had engaged the Earth Warder on multiple occasions, taking as many losses as she had wins. Notharian's battalions were better trained than any other force on the field. One could not simply strike his armies with a hammer of force and expect them to break. No, one needed a modicum of strategy to face Notharian. This war brings me no joy, Razvik said. One day I may face my own flesh and blood on the battlefield. Virenoth made an empathetic rumbling noise in her throat. We must trust that the truth has spread among the drakes of the Broodlands. Talonstraws knew he had been ordered in the egg. Other kidnapped whelps must know it now, too. They will not raise their talons against their primal kin. I believe you, Razvik replied. Still the thought haunts me. How could it not? Yernoth replied. I find no glory in combat, but the aspects leave us little choice. I will not bow to the will of their masters, nor will I stand by as they decimate corrupt or imprison our kind. I And I will not let them bury my sister under that hateful mountain. Virenoth cast her gaze across the valley. Along the eastern mountain range, she could just make out a large glimmering blue ward set into the mountain's face. According to Eridicron's rock furies, that was well Nel where Neltharion kept the storm eater imprisoned. What had Razageth done to deserve such a well-defended prison? Or more like what other horrors had she witnessed here in the Reach, crimes the Aspects would not want their primal kin to know? Rezvik nodded. I will fight by your side, Viranoth, until we have justice for the atrocities committed against our kind. When the barriers fall, we attack at once, Viranoth stated. Have Cezans engage the Earth in Bulwark, and send the Ice Talons to destroy the Draconid's dragon killers on the border. Our objective is to push to the Wearing Grounds, but we will not throw lives away if both Nelberian and Alexstrasza take to the field. I will not fight two aspects at once. Understood, Azvik said, bobbing his head. Another hour passed, then two. As the sun touched the horizon and set the western mountains of flame, the air began to crackle. Red sparks exploded across the border like a curtain of fireworks. Embers rained from the sky. As they cascaded to the ground, Alexstrasza's barrier was no more. Bugles erupted, the black dragon flight formed their ranks over the mountains, the flight leader's voices rose over the sound of hundreds of wing beats, confident and sure. A half smile turned up one corner of Viranoth's lips. She leapt skyward. With a single beat of her wings, she froze the moisture in the air, blanketing the peaks in a thick fog. She whipped it toward the reach as her wing leaders roared, signaling the attack. Razvik followed her along with Nithruz, a primal dragon she'd chosen as her third in command. The mist tumbled into the reach, filling its great valleys and giving her forces cover. Her frost-scale warriors cruised through the fog which coalesced around their bodies and solidified to icy armor on their scales. The frost scales fell upon the black dragons, whistling through the air. The two armies collided with such force that the sound of their congress echoed off the sides of the mountains. Roars and screams swirled high. The Draconid launched burning lava into the sky with their catapults illuminating the fog from within. The scent of blood tinged the air. Virenoth's mobile ice talons dived beneath the frost scales, heading for the Draconid position on the mountain ranges below. Massive wooden javelins shot through the fog, striking several ice talons in the chest or wings. Others fell upon the Draconid, tearing them limb from limb and smashing their weapons. But the Earth Warder's shadow scales appeared from cracks and crevices in the mountains as if chiseled out of the stone itself. 
The Black Dragons leapt upon Virnoth's Ice Talon soldiers, driving them away from the Draconid and the heavy artillery. Mithruz, join them on the front lines, Virnoth said. Stoltria is leading the Earthen Bulwark in Lavarian's place. She was one of the dragons responsible for Vatelinoth's death. Kill her. Mithrilis bobbed his head and dived for the front lines, heading for an armored black dragon who fought three primalists at once. Stoltria flipped in the air, slamming her tail into a storm talon's head and breaking its neck. Once we've destroyed their artillery, have the frost scales push the black dragon flight into the valley, Virenoth said to Razvik. If we fight them over the mountains, their light infantry will try to pit us against the peaks. She had seen Neltharion's onyx reavers fall from the sky like hunting hawks, slamming their targets into mountaintops and snapping wings, spines, and necks. The maneuver was difficult to defend against. The reavers could reach blisteringly high speeds while falling and dropped from the sky like meteorites. Neltharion had employed the strategy at Emberstone and the Glacial Maw, as well as smaller skirmishes throughout the Dragon Wilds. Mirnoth hadn't seen the reavers at the reach, but that didn't mean Neltharion wasn't holding them in reserve. Where is Neltharion? Virnoth wondered, ill at ease. The black aspect dwarfed even the largest of ordered dragons, making him easy to spot on the battlefield. Virnoth let loose a frustrated growl. Where are you hiding? As a wing of ice talons rocketed past, destroying more of the black aspect's toys, Virnoth spun the icy fog around her talons, forming a lance of ice. Rotating once in the air, she propelled it at a group of draconid working the ballasty on the mountain flank. The ice shard crashed into one of the catapults, freezing it and everything within 20 wing lengths of its position. She saw, shot a second lance at one of Neltharion's wing leaders on the front line. The dragon dropped from the sky and shattered into icy fragments on the rocks below. Neltharion would not leave the reach undefended. Had he gone to the Obsidian Citadel expecting a Riddicron to attack there? The Stone Scaled had not joined the other incarnates on this foray, preferring a two-pronged approach that would allow him to trap Neltharion's stronghold in a pincer. If Farrakh could manage to smash his way into Stonefray Falls, which might be asking too much of the hot-headed, hot-tempered incarnate, he and Virenoth would assail the Citadel from the north and the south. No. Something was wrong. Virenoth could sense it in her gut even as she launched lance after lance, watching Neltharion's dragons fall from the skies. As the last of the Draconid were dispatched below, Mithros and Sazans trumpeted in advance. The frost scales surged forward, pushing the black dragons into the valley and surrounding them on three sides. Still, the earth warder did not appear. Virenoth followed her forces into the reach, wary. Razvik fell back, joining the incarnate above the battle. Have you seen the earth warder? she asked him. Razvik shook his head. He may be fighting on another front. No, I know Neltharion well, Virenoth said. Neither his flight commander nor his flight master is here which means he must have direct command of the forces in the Reach. As Virnoth said those words, the fog shifted overhead. Her ears picked up a faint, whistling sound. When she looked up, she saw fifteen black dragons plummeting straight toward her. Reavers! she shouted, spreading her wings wide to shock the air with frost. She dived. The frozen heart knew she could not outfly such monsters, but the chill would make them less maneuverable when they opened their wings again. She plummeted toward the foot of the mountain, her fog thinned, sparks caught fire in the earth below, first two, then ten, then twenty, no, not fire, eyes, twenty-five pairs of eyes all watching her every movement. The soil began to roil and churn. To Virnoth's dismay, a company of black dragons rose from their hiding places in the loam, shaking the dirt from their backs. The earth cracked open and a massive black-scaled forefoot shot out and sank its talons into the ground. Neltharion, Virenoth thought, her heart rising into her throat. The ground rushed closer and the reavers fell faster than she. They would be upon her in another heartbeat or two. Virenoth opened her wings and shot over the heads of her enemies. Up ahead, Neltharion emerged from the earth, eyes blazing. With a toothy grin, the black aspect dug his talons into the ground and hurled a chunk of earth at her. Virenoth closed her wings and rolled left, but the boulder slammed into her right hip. Soil and stones exploded on impact. A painful series of shocks and bright pops burst along her spine. She lost her momentum, crashing into the ground as the reavers screamed over her head. Before Virenoth could regain her footing, Neltharion leapt on her side, pushing her into the earth as his four talons punctured her scales. She shrieked at him, punching her thorny wing talon into the gap in his shoulder armor. The earth warder roared and leapt back, blood welled from the wounds, slicking his onyx scales. Virenoth scrambled to her feet, panting. 
Her pulse thrummed through her chest and in her eardrum so loud she could almost hear the din of battle. She lowered her head to protect her throat. So the earth warder had managed to take her unawares, using his reavers to chase her to the ground. Had he also planned to have his earthen bulwark fall back, luring the frozen heart and her forces into a false sense of security? Then he had taken advantage of her survival instincts to force her into a vulnerable, pos vulnerable position. She growled at the thought. Overhead, Razvik trumpeted four short blasts, warning the primalists that Viranoth had been grounded. The frost scales panicked, their formations deteriorating. Sazan's bugled a response, but before the primalists could dive to protect their incarnate, the black dragon flight surged forward, pushing the primalists back to the ridge and trapping the incarnate behind enemy lines. High in the skies, the reavers began to second descend through the fog. Fifty, maybe sixty dragons plummeted, plunged toward the front line scrums. Viranoth narrowed her eyes, turning her attention back to the earth warder. Four black dragons flanked him while others circled in the air above. The mountain blocked her retreat. Two twin waterfalls crashed down the Rocky Mountain's face, filling the air with mist. Naltharion had outplayed her, yes, but that didn't mean he had won. Viranoth drew in a deep breath, letting her blood chill and her heart slow. She would need her wits to be razor sharp if she was going to survive this encounter. The Earth Warder rolled his injured shoulder, then tilted his head to crack his neck in a languid manner. Do you think you can win against me? Truly, the Black Aspect said with a sneer. He lifted his head. Our campaign in the Dragon's Wilds was whelp's play compared to what we will unleash upon you in the Broodlands. Viranoth curled her lip, bearing a fang. You've lost every wing length of territory from here to Harrow's Deep Neltharion. Do you think you can stand against the might of the Incarnates? I will free my sister, and together we shall lay the Broodlands and all your hateful cities low. I was the one to trap your sister under the mountain, Eltharion said, his words edged in malice. He stalked toward her, his eyes burning with hate. And now I think I shall do the same to you. Unlikely, Viranoth said through gritted teeth. As the earth water lunged at her, she leapt into the air, sending a shockwave of frigid cold from her chest. The waterfalls froze in an instant. When she shouted her fury, they shattered into a million glittering razor-edged pieces. With a forward snap of her wings, she sent the shards barreling at the black aspect and his forces. The ice sang as it shredded wing membranes and splintered scales, sending the black dragons around her tumbling through the mist like dark shadows. Armor cracked in the cold, screams cut through the fog. The black aspect howled in rage, consumed in a cloud of sparkling ice. Before he could launch another attack, Viranoth fled. She took the ice that whirled off her wings and condensed it, forming thick icicles that hung in the air over her shoulders. She found the weakest flank in the black dragonflight's front lines and smashed the spears through the gaps in their armor. With a roar, the frost scales leapt into the breach, clearing a path for their incarnate. Viranoth sailed past them, banked, and turned to hover behind a wall of her primalists. Too close, Viranoth thought bitterly, breathing hard. Below her, Neltharion slew ten of her frost scales with a single swipe of his tail. The other frost scales scattered before the earth warder. Viranoth! Vazvik shouted, climbing toward her, the fear clear in his eyes. I saw you drop, but nothing that happened after. Are you unhurt? I'm fine, Viranoth replied with a little growl, one meant for herself and her own denseness. Neltharion obviously intended to try to capture her rather than kill her, but she wasn't sure why that would be. In prior encounters, it had seen Neltharion and the other aspects had tried to kill the Incarnates with brute force. Why, she still had scores in her hide from some of their talons, and her left shoulder had never been the same after a particularly violent encounter with a bronze flight leader. What new strategy is this, Alexstrasza? she wondered, watching with dispassion as Neltharion ravaged the frost scales. What are you doing? As if summoned by the frozen heart's thoughts, a faint ruby glow appeared to the southeastern horizon. Mirnoth turned her head. The light spread across the valley, illuminating the region in gentle warmth. It melted Virnoth's icy fog and cleared the storms from the skies, pushing them back to reveal a glittering wing of stars. Alexstrasza stood atop a tower at the edge of the reach, blazing like a miniature sun. Her reds pushed back the cold with crimson fire. The very sight of her old friend filled Virnoth with icy rage. There was a time when she could look upon the Dragon Queen with empathy, but now all she saw was an enemy. One day she would tear Alexstrasza from the skies with her own talons. This she swore on Razageth's name and on all the eggs crushed under the heel of order magic. Sound the retreat, the frozen heart told Razvik. We will fight another day. 
All told, the Black Dragon flight had lost 18 dragons to Viranoth and her primalists on the first advance. A paltry number compared with the losses the primalists incurred, but Neltharion still mourned every fire-hearted dragon who left the sky. The Black Dragon flight placed the pitch-covered pyres along the shores of the lagoon in the caldera of the Menders. The moon's light slicked the obsidian scales of the dead. No matter how stony his exterior, Neltharion still found himself stricken with grief at the sight of them all. His flight had already given so much of the reach. How many more would fall in the coming days? How many more would be asked to give their lives for peace? Alexstrasza might believe that Neltharion had wanted this war, but he hated it as much as she did. The Earth Warder had ever been a builder and a protector, not a breaker. He loathed seeing so many bright lights extinguished at the talons of their enemies, so much potential wasted, just like it had been at the Battle of Storm Sunder. The earthen bulwark of the Black Dragon flight gathered silently on the beach. They perched on the mountain cliffs, not ready to say goodbye to their comrades and friends, their family, their flight. Unlike the primalists who left their dead for the worms, every fallen member of the Black Dragon flight had been retrieved and placed upon pyres by the Draconid. Now Therian would send the dragon's remains into the heavens on cinders, so that they might fly free. What bones were too heavy for the winds would be interred at the violet ossuary, the veiled ossuary. The fallen deserved to rest in stone. You have flown your last, my friends, he said, voice strained, throat tight. Your sacrifice allows us to fight another day, for that your name shall never be forgotten. Now Therian closed his eyes and drew in a deep breath. His lungs superheated the air until flames curled around his fangs. Now Therian lifted his head and dug his talons into the soft sand, then with the power building in his diaphragm, he swept his arc down in an arc and let the fire inside him erupt. The pyres burst into a massive conflagration. All around him the black dragonflight lifted their voices and named the fallen. What started as a whisper grew into a roar. Carving their comrades' names into their memories as fire consumed their physical vessels. The flight kept a vigil till the pyres burned low. There's something... I don't know. There's something um, bittersweet about like this cremation. It's a tough... Um, it kind of strikes me in this moment. I've lost uh, a lot of people in my life, and almost to a to a man, to a woman, to a combo. It's very common for the cremation, and while it seems nice to have a gravestone for someone to go to, um, it doesn't matter. I don't know. I can see both sides. I will say the, the closest people in my life that I lost... And I've lost um, a lot of, of all of my best friends um, and a lot of family. The, there were some, there were a lot of struggles where um, it took me years and years and years and it never fully dispersed uh, this just weird alternate reality that would, that I would go to in my literal dreams. Um, where I still had these people in my life. And while those are nice dreams, every time waking up is like suffering the loss from scratch again. And I wonder if not having a closure point, I wonder if that closure point would help some. But also, you know, there's the uh, eco-friendliness of, of, you know, do you want to take up that space on the earth and all that stuff. Uh, and so I don't know. I don't have a decision on that made for myself. I think I have to think on it more. <laughs> so there you go. We'll keep reading. Sorry, just seeing this. Um, just, it just, I don't know. It hit me. It hit me in a, in a spot inside where I thought about some of this stuff. As the Draconid stepped forward to gather the embers and bones of the dead, a familiar voice interrupted Eltharian's thoughts. Congratulations, my aspect, on your victory against the Frozen Heart. The Earthwater turned his head, glad to see it was only Lavarian. The flight commander bowed his head and said, May I have permission to join you? 
But of course, Neltharion said, turning his gaze back to the ashes. I am told the stone scale did not appear on the battlefield today, neither at the Citadel, nor in Thaldrasis or the Azure Span. He did not. Valvarian sat beside Neltharion, watching the Draconid scoop ashes into lightweight metal vessels. I admit I am surprised. I expected the Incarnates to bring their full strength to bear against us once the barriers fell. <clears throat> the Black Aspect said, thinking, His absence may indicate that he knows about the Vault, and is unwilling to risk capture. If Viranoth had been the Incarnate's point of contact with the Rebellious Drakes, it was possible she knew of the Vault too, and simply did not care about the danger. The Aspects hadn't spread word widely of the project, but they certainly hadn't hidden it either. The flight commander turned to his aspect. Speaking of the vault, the flight leaders tell me you nearly captured the frozen heart on your first attempt. Huh. Notharian replied, nearly is not a success, nor is it something to be celebrated. Lavarian smirked, as you say, my lord. They will be upon us again, Notharian said, turning away from the ashes. Come, Lavarian, we have much work to do here the sun rises. That was a super long chapter. But it was good. Uh, now that we're finally underway, it was good. I don't know. I, I, I did like that one. Despite the length of it, sometimes when they're really long, it can be a bit of a, um, it can get to be a slog depending on the writing. And But that was a good chapter. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so, so much for watching and for listening. We have another episode in the pipe, 5 by 5 for 64%. So we're getting close to the two-thirds mark. Thanks for watching and for listening. I appreciate you, and I'll see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.